Thank you, Gina, for hosting. I appreciate your support. And thank you, everybody who's coming and sharing your time and presence with me today. <laughs> um, so before I begin, I just want to name attention that I'm feeling and put it in the space between us. But I'm going to be talking to you about this new paradigm that's like more participatory, inclusive, and power with. And I'm wanting to give you a learning experience that reflects that essence. But given that I've promised you the deliverables of talking about seven concepts, I'm having a very hard time fitting in more participatory ways of being in this actual space. So I'm gonna do my best to move through the material and leave space for digestion and us to chew on it together. But I'm also gonna end with my email. And like, I really do want this to be a two-way discussion. So if it doesn't happen in the time frame given here, I really welcome you to extend the time borders um, by reaching out to me beyond the scope of this presentation. So. With that, I am going to start by sharing my screen. I'm a visual learner, so anyone who's a visual learner will probably do well with me because I rely a lot on pictures. Um, and in naming that, I am not going to see you guys as well because I'll be seeing the screen. So um, I welcome you, Gina, and Bernadette is a special friend. Like We're kind of working together as well. So if anyone wants to interrupt me because there's a burning clarifying question or something, I welcome you to interrupt me. Um, otherwise, I will give you periods of time for question and and answers. Does this make sense? Like, are you clear on so far? Okay, thank you for the feedback. All right, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Okay, and I'm going to share my slides. Bernadette showed me this new way to share my slides. Give me one second. Okay, are you guys seeing the art and science of paradigm shifting? Are you all seeing those slides? Okay, so welcome to the art and science of paradigm shifting, which is really, I invite you to consider that we're just talking about how to learn together to play a new game. So I'm hoping that you sense this is kind of like a playful game approach. Um, hang on, um, let me just go here. This presentation was really inspired around a, an observation of a challenge that like, we're all really dealing with the effects of disruption. You know, a word for that, you can call it VUCA. And if you know that, great. If you don't, we're going to talk about it. But we're kind of experiencing the effects of something that's happening externally to us. And we may not even know that there's a name for this or what it is. Or maybe we know about VUCA, but in like the daily happenings of our life, we're not really connecting the phenomena of VUCA to what's happening. So the belief is, is that the more we understand, the better we can operate together in the field. Um, in a way, this presentation might feel like a fire hose of information, which I'm really trying to avoid. So um, my hopes for this um, presentation is that if we leave understanding um, the larger whole that, um, of which we're a part, um, as well as how the different terms fit together, that to me would be success. And so just a reminder of the terms we said we would touch on together, change, VUCA, overwhelm, power, learning, purpose, and flow. And I, I'm thinking that a lot of you know many of these concepts, but I'm really inviting us to look at how they might fit together so we can more strategically navigate. Um, so I'm gonna be offering, I'm very into orienting um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So what I'm really offering is a map. So when information comes at you, you have something, you have a framework to slot information into. And it's a very simple map, it's this, and that, and then this line in between, and everything should just slot nicely into this. Um, to give you a sense of the presentation, you know, this little bit of welcoming, um, I'm inviting us to get up and out of the waters of life. You know, we're all busy treading water, trying to stay afloat in rapid change. Um, and we're gonna go high up. So rather than thinking of this as like, I need to learn everything, I'm inviting you to just sit back, relax, think of this as a helicopter tour. You're just getting a sight of things. Um, and the two things that we're gonna really focus on, again, is the whole and the seven terms. And then at the end, I really hope to leave a nice chunk of time for question and answer, as well as space so that you guys can digest and clear your palate between all the different um, presentations that you'll be tasting throughout the day. 
Um, <laughs> this is me being playful, but um, you know, I am in a way, if we go with the metaphor of helicopter, I'm kind of your pilot and you're kind of putting your time and your life in my hands. And so who the heck am I? So um, I think what's important to note is for one thing, I'm white and North American. And so I am doing a lot of work on my privilege and power, but I still have lots of blind spots. Um, and it matters to me to um, it be acknowledging everybody's presence and inherent value. And if I accidentally do something that treats anyone as less as than valuable or somehow gives a less than sense to somebody, I'd want to repair the space. So just um, again, you'll have my email. I don't think we'll have time to fix it today, but I would be very interested in repairing the space between us. So. Um, as I said, I want to offer you a map because orienting um, matters to me. And my whole life, I've kind of felt confused by this world. So I kind of got here and I was like, this is not the world I signed up for. Um, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. So this is how I often felt in life. Um, and so I've always looked for like, what are some markers, things to orient to, like my internal compass that will help me navigate worlds that didn't really make sense in a way that um, aligned with my values. Um, and so this map that I'm going to be sharing with you really comes from years and years of research. And my research was inspired by an observation, like from when I was little, but just like, whoa, the earth and its inhabitants are hurting. I mean, there's so much pain and suffering around us. Um, and this isn't something that other people are doing to us. This is something that humans are doing to ourselves and each other. And yet, despite our best intentions to do things differently, and I really do think humans are well-intentioned um, for the most part, um, but despite our best intentions, you know, business as usual patterns remain locked in, which left me with two questions. Why does meaningful change remain so elusive? Like, you know, with all this stuff, you know, Pascal was talking about climate change, you know, we've known about this, and yet we just haven't been able to make the change necessary. Like, why is meaningful change so elusive? And then how might humanity's power, which I think is tremendous, but a lot of times it's locked in conflict. I spend a lot of the day arguing with myself about what I should and shouldn't do, um, or arguing with someone else. And if I could free that energy, if we could free that energy to become a force of healing in our world. So those were my guiding questions. Um, and I wound up when I was sniffing for, you know, Charles Eisenstein refers to it as the more beautiful world our heart knows is possible. But I kept sniffing, sniffing for this world that I signed up for. And I would find aspects of it and um, or it in niches of what um, we're now referring to as these transformative social systems. Um, and they're basically ancient, you know, there's a lot of indigenous wisdom, ancient and modern wisdom traditions that are centering an ethos of collaboration. And you can see that sociocracy is one of these transformative social systems. Um, and it's the common element between all of us here today. So I want to um, pause here, like this is the section where I'm inviting us to consider what might be the larger whole of which we as individuals are a part. And I, I'm going to slow myself down. I can feel myself racing. Okay. Ah. Um, I'm saying I'm spending time here because I think it's valuable to do so because the magnitude of the challenges that humanity is facing right now can feel very big and overwhelming. There's the word overwhelm, which we'll be talking about, but um, especially when we feel alone or separate from. And so I think um, it's helpful to um, really locate ourselves within the communities of other people that we might belong. So I am suggesting that you consider, and I'll consider that I am a nested in many, many different systems. And I'm gonna explain the layers of these systems, but some of us are acting as free agents and some of us belong to a bigger organization. But um, anybody who's here at this conference today belongs to an even larger community of practice. And this um, event is an opportunity to see the global reach, how people coming from all over the world and from so many different sectors, um, and to learn this approach, this, this methodology that centers an ethos of collaboration. Um, and we'll touch on lightly how um, you can go from one transformative social system into the ecosystem of transformative social systems. 
and that this is perhaps um, part of a larger movement. You know, Ted this morning was using the word of sociocracy as a movement, and that there's a movement of movements going on to kind of help heal our world. Um, are we all together so far, everybody? Yes, okay, <laughs> all right. Um, so sociocracy, we're saying, is part of a transformative social systems. And basically, this is a word, this is a concept that is being created by people in and around this ecosystem. But many of us who come into any one of these transformative social systems pretty quickly are like, wait a second, you know, that makes a lot of sense with this other one. And, and then there's this thing where we start swimming between these different transformative social systems and find that they're like interoperable. They're almost complementary to each other. So I'm gonna use sociocracy because that's the shared language between us, um, but we tend to find these by something that's visible. Oh, sociocracy, yeah, that's a decision-making tool. Like, tell me about that. So we tend to come in through a tip of what's visible. And this, I'm basing this on the, um, the iceberg model of theory U. But I mean, if you're in sociocracy for a while, you start scratching your head and all of a sudden you're like, whoa, wait a second, this is way more complex. Like it's a whole system. And and there's actual structures that my organization or I can start adopting and living into. And then the more time you spend in sociocracy, you start to realize it's, it's actually based on a very different value and belief and an, even a different paradigm and, and operating from a different source, like an, a different inner state. And we're gonna be, you know, I'm, I'm using language, paradigm, stuff like this. I will be explaining this soon, but in this slide, I just really wanna explain that there's stuff that's visible and it's more that out, um, ex outside structures of a, of a transformative social system. And then there's this, stuff of um, the inner things. And, and we're talking about paradigms. So let me just move into paradigms for one second. Um, what is a paradigm? Really briefly, it's basically, it's a set of rules um, that define a boundary and tells you how to behave in the boundary in order to be successful. And a metaphor for a paradigm is a game, which is why I'm talking about playing, learning together to play a new game. Because if you understand paradigm as a game, like tennis is a paradigm, um, you can understand that a paradigm shift is as simple as a change to a new game, a new set of rules. And so what I am proposing to you, like, I don't know if you recognize this, but this is the map that I'm offering you. But um, that first um, circle is I'm talking about a paradigm that most of us were raised in. And it is a paradigm that said we can get order through control. Well, like we can control situations. We can control the external conditions. We can understand something by reducing it to something very simple. And this was a highly effective paradigm. We solved a lot of issues and made a lot of quote unquote progress through this paradigm. Um, and, and there's a lot of cost. And I think, you know, as, as I think we're seeing a lot of the cost now more than ever. This other paradigm is a paradigm that um, treats things as wholes and is very capable of managing complexity. Um, and this is a way of achieving order through emergence by allowing order to emerge. Um, so, I mean, you can talk about this as old paradigm, new paradigm. Um, anyway, simple, complex. Those are some different ways to look at it. What I think is important to understand is that I'm, I believe we're actually in the midst of a paradigm shift. Um, towards this way of being that is embedded in these transformative social systems, that's embedded in sociocracy. And I don't think it's necessarily happening because people are saying this is ethical, this is how we should be together. Um, but I think it's because um, we're going to be talking about change, particularly exponential change. And in this volatility of exponential change, the structures, these top down regulatory structures, how we achieve control, um, they, they are robust systems that were built to withstand change, but they are starting to break down in the extreme volatility. And so um, we are going to need to re-architecture every single structure we have in society. And I believe that success is going to come to those who adopt the structures and develop the skills that support more participatory, inclusive, power with ways of being as this is what we're finding is effective in these complex conditions we're navigating. Okay, so far, everybody. Okay, just go for that high level. You don't really need to understand it. Just let it wash over you. 
um, hang on. So what I, um, the reason for the paradigm shift, again, I don't think it's something that humans are actually making happen, but um, paradigms are very good for solving a set of problems. Like we have solved for very simplified problems, but there were a set of problems called complex or wicked problems that we've been unable to um, address with the current paradigm. And so this, like the shelf of all these complex problems, oh, we'll deal with that. We'll deal with that. We'll deal with that. The shelf is kind of collapsing, kind of tipping us into this new paradigm. It's, it, this is my hypothesis. And I, the, what I hope you walk away with is even though volatility and the time we're in is not necessarily easy to navigate, there's a lot of potential, like when the rules change, the whole world can change. So there's some, there's really an opportunity that we're living in, in this moment of time. Okay. Just sensing back into the holes of which we're a part. Again, I, I was saying you can come into one of these, but once you come into it, it's almost like a sun, like you come into this new values, this new paradigm. And by source, I mean the inner condition, the sense of like what's inside creates what's outside. When you come into this different way of being, it's easier to float amongst the different um, um, transformative social systems. So again, um, I, you know, Ted was talking about sociocracy as a movement, and I know Ted have and I have talked about with, you know, and Ted, Jerry too, but like, this is a movement of movements. And so there's a strength in um, the, the breadth and depth of this movement. And what I am proposing too is, I don't know if you're familiar with the book, Blessed Unrest by Paul Hawken, but he was observing what he calls the largest social movement in human history. And it's so varied, it's so diverse, but it's like coming together to work on all the problems that are happening in the world. But it's acting on problems in a way that restores, it's a restorative model. It's restoring grace, restoring justice, restoring beauty. It's about reholing the world, you know, whole and health come from the same root world. So it's really about restoring the world and ourselves to wholeness and well-being. And not only is this a powerful thing in this moment in time, but um, he talks about a concept from the poet Gary Snyder called the Great Underground. And what I'm trying to offer you is that I actually think anybody who's here today who's learning about sociocracy, even though we're at all different developmental stages in it, is that we're part of a larger movement that is historically goes way back all the way to the Paleolithic. You know, all the people who've spoken for the planet, other species for interdependence, you know, there's that wholeness right there. Um, and, you know, there have been empires that have come and dominated, but they tend to go, you know, empires have come and gone, but this life force has coursed under, through, and around these empires. So I just invite you to consider, you know, the problems are big, but if you understand that you are actually acting along with a lot of people um, throughout time and currently who are working together to move the dial on creating a more beautiful world, I think it becomes easier. So I just invite you, you know, take it or leave it. We're done with this part, but um, I invite you to consider yourself as embedded in these larger movement of movements. Um, and the last thing I would just want to say about it is Margaret Wheatley says to strengthen a system, regardless of the scale of that fractile, connect it to itself so it can learn about itself from itself. And we're going to be talking about learning. And I think one of the questions is, where do we go to learn? And so I'm really inviting you guys to consider learning from, if you identify with this, to consider um, spending a lot of your time connecting within this ecosystem and, and basing your learning within this ecosystem. I'm going to pause. This is a place for Q&A based on this first part. If you have any burning questions, um, you know, there's the whole seven terms. Let me stop sharing my screen just to see all your beautiful faces. How are you holding up? You guys okay so far? Hello, hello. <laughs> um, any burning questions um, or do you want to keep going or what would be helpful for you guys? 
All right, let me just say, if no one moves to speak, I just, I then, um, let me give you the whole, and then, and then you'll have more to chew on and like move things around with. So like, this is your chance to say, help, help. Um, but if you're good to keep just relaxing and just taking in the sights, then I'm gonna encourage us to keep going. Good, oh, Francois is here, hello Francois. Okay, um, let me keep going. So I'm gonna go back and share my screen. Give me one second, guys, hang on, share screen. Hang on. Oh, there's a question in chat. Hang on. Thank you, John. You mentioned wanting to can you connect beyond your presentation. Oh, yes. Thank you, John. I don't know if I can make it. I'm traveling, but I, we'll talk. Hang on. I, we'll talk. But thank you for that reminder. I would love to show up in that space. Okay, I'm sharing my slides. Hang on. Let me share my screen. Let me share. Are you guys seeing my slides again? Okay. Moving, uh, we're 18 minutes. Okay, we're moving into the next part. Here are the seven terms and how they fit together. Okay, relax, sit back. So there they are again, I'm not gonna repeat them. But what I am gonna say is I'm chunking, here's the map, so just to orient, get ready to catch, like it's like a baseball mitt, like you just know where to slot the information, okay? There's this, this, or this third component. All right, so I am putting change, VUCA, and overwhelm over here by this paradigm that we had talked about, the command, the order through control paradigm, um, and to look at change. So imagine we're in a helicopter. I'm going to take us around. I'm going to say, you know, notice this feature, like what I think is most salient to notice, but we're not going to really get out of the helicopter and start touching things. Um, but when people talk about change, I think it's really important to listen for the distinction between external change and internal change. And so this was based on Dr. Montessori's work, but she, you know, she was talking about you know, the capacity of humanity to put things into motion, you know, all our innovations around fire, the wheel, agriculture. And there was a co-evolutionary spiral. There was a relationship between the changes that humans set in motion. And then you know, when we discovered fire, you know, it changed how people got together. When we discovered agriculture, you know, humans as individuals and collectives had to adapt and change to like, wow, life is so different. And we changed to fit the changing times that we created. So again, external change and internal change. What I think is very important for people to notice about external change is that there's an inflection point. This pattern, which was kind of linear, started to take a different curve. And this curve is called a doubling pattern. I didn't know anything about this, but it is um, also known as exponential. So I, this is a similar graph, but I'm really honing in on this. For people who are speaking pattern language, this pattern is often referred to as deceptive and then explosive. Um, so you know my question, like why are we stuck? I think part of the reason why we're stuck is because change looks different and we're not actually used to dealing with this pattern. And this pattern in general is a, is a hard pattern, but we're also not familiar with it. And the only way I, I was like, oh yeah, I think I heard that once with there's a mind game. Would you rather have a penny that doubles every day for 30 days or a million dollars? Um, and, you know, people, I'm not good at math, but some people who are good at math will actually start to do the calculation. And even if you get to day 10, you're up to $5. Who wants the penny? Give me the million dollars. If you're really patient and you get up to day 20, ah, $5,000. Yeah, give me the million dollars. It's not, you know, so it's tracking along. It doesn't look worth it. It doesn't look worth it. And then all of a sudden, this pattern becomes explosive. And it's not into the third column that, that not only does it equal a million dollars, it actually exceeds the million dollars, but it's not until the very end that you recognize what's happening. So exponential change, that's what's important to pay attention to. It's a different type of change than we're used to dealing with. And I think in the past, you know, I'm talking to you about that we tried to establish order through control. We built these robust structures and robust structures survive by resisting change. And I think in a way we've kind of become robust structures, like we kind of batten down the hatches, like, and has the storm of change passed and are we on the other side yet? So the last two years have really given us a taste of the disruptions of this new world. Um, and I think a lot of us are like, oh, are we on the other side yet? And people who are studying this say that like, mm, not only are we not on the other side, we're actually here. <laughs> like there isn't another side. We're actually only about 1% in, literally just starting. And that most of the disruptions are actually ahead of us. 
Um, so this isn't something that it's like it's useful to try to wait it out. This is something about like we need to start moving along with the changing conditions. So changing conditions is my link into VUCA. Um, so VUCA, and what I think I'm putting, let me, VUCA, I don't know if it actually belongs in this paradigm, but extreme VUCA I'm saying belongs to this paradigm. So what's VUCA? Some of you may know it, some of you may not. My understanding is VUCA is a military acronym from the United States. Um, the military started talking about, whoa, wait a second, guys, stuff we've been doing all along that's been so highly effective, all of a sudden we're not getting the same results. Something's different. We're doing the same thing. So something outside of us is different. The conditions, the context we're working in is different. And they're like, we just need a name for this. So VUCA is actually an acronym. The V stands for volatility, which really talks about like the rate, the pace, the magnitude of change, particularly in an unpredictable pattern. Uncertainty deals with like that ability, like we just don't know what's coming next, like that sense of like we keep waiting for the next shoe to drop, like what's going to happen now. Um, complexity, which to me is like, it feels like a knotted ball of yarn. And when you try to tease out a knot over here, someone over here says, ouch. Um, and then amb A stands for ambiguity. I think that's ambiguity. <laughs> and that's what ambiguity is. It's like, it's hard to discern what's what's happening behind the things we're seeing. So ambiguity, it's just hard to understand what's behind stuff. Most cultures throughout history have used the metaphor of water to refer to life. And when you think about the ocean, like it is VUCA, it's volatile, it's uncertain, it's complex. Thank goodness it is. It's its whole ecosystem. Like. VUCA is not a bad thing. Like VUCA is life, life is VUCA. And that's the good news. Like I wanna say like VUCA is something our ancestors knew how to deal with. It's something we know how to deal with in our DNA. That's the good news. The not so good news is that for like the last, some people would say a hundred, you know, several hundred years. Some people would argue even thousands of years with this paradigm of order through control. We have um, kind of, taken ourselves out of nature, risen ourselves above it, um, built these robust structures so that we didn't have to deal with all the fluctuations of messy life. Um, and it was helpful for a time, but there was a lot of hidden costs that I think we just kind of like threw into the ocean. And so the, it, the what has gone on outside of us is so interconnected. It is so volatile that um, those structures are coming down and we're landing plump in the waters of life. Okay, so key feature to remember, yes, we can do VUCA, not a big deal. Extreme VUCA, yikes, none of us really know about this, but we can figure this out together. Oof. This is a natural segue into overwhelm because <laughs> I don't know about how you're feeling, but anytime I really sit in like, wow, this is really what might be happening and try it on. You can always take the shirt off, but like some people are saying, this is the situation. Like my heart starts to race. My muscles get tense. Like I feel very overwhelmed. So we're going to talk about overwhelm. Um, so this is the um, line of external change, and you can also think about this as challenge, like um, which is actually an opportunity to act. But you know, all the changes we set in motion um, are, especially technologically, there's a lot of new opportunity to act. There's a lot of liberation, a lot of freedom, and um, an opportunity that we didn't have. But um, this can also be considered our internal skill or our capacity to act. And so that co-evolutionary relationship of our, um, our ability to manage what we set in motion has split. And it is that split between like our capacity to act and our um, the opportunity to act and our actually skill, the challenge versus skill that I'm just saying like, guys, that's a rift. And so overwhelmed to me is the somatic sensation of, wait a second, we're supposed to be able to like manage the stuff that we're doing. Like the, the stuff we set in motion is now like controlling us versus us in control of what we're setting in motion. So um, 
um, Theo Dawson, I don't know if you know her work with Lectica, but she studies complexity um, and leadership in complexity. And she refers to this similar thing as the complexity gap. So you, I just want to say you might hear different words for it. And Kagan and Leahy, the um, deliberately developmental organizations that Bernadette's going to be talking about, they have a quote that says, you know, um, the story of complexity is not just a story about the world. It's also a story about people. And there's a growing mismatch between the world's complexity and our own. And so anytime you're feeling overwhelmed or anxious, like I invite you to consider that it's really a reminder um, for growth and development and, a, and an incentive to really start working on increasing our skill to act in these new conditions. That was the rift. The shift is this. Um, there is a way to catch up with this. Like um, if we could start prioritizing learning and development. So if you think about, um, and Francois here, but he talks a lot about um, Japan and Toyota, but they weren't just developing work, you know, cars or something. They were simultaneously developing people. And so anyone who's into permaculture, it's this layering function that I think rather than separating learning from work, my guess is in the future and in the present, we're really gonna start layering learning learning in the work that we're going to be learning in real time. So I am moving on to the concept of power. And my link is this John Buck, who I think is here too, in his book, We the People, he um, kind of illuminates that there's a social, like a psychological, sociological definition of power, which is the ability to influence another. And, and that's a very positional type of power. But there's also the more from the physical science that power is the ability to get work done. And so I am putting power in the background of the paradigms because I just think power is a part of life. It's, um, it's not about the social constructs of the paradigms, it just lives. So as we fly our helicopter over to power, one of the key features I'd want you to notice about is we don't talk about power. I mean, I don't know about you, maybe you do in your circles, but in most of the circles I flock in, people are not talking about power. There's a sense that it's scary, Ugh, it's evil, those powerful people, blah. and we just get really squeamish and uncomfortable. And, I, and there's definitely reason for that. Um, so let's look at power in the different paradigms. So in the um, order through control paradigm, people organized around the pattern of power over, power under. Um, and in, in this new paradigm, this is really about power with. And as Bernadette speaks so beautifully to, you can't really do power with unless you're really experiencing power within. So let's unpack power just a little bit more. I tend to see these paradigms almost as energy fields, um, you know, just like a magnetic field or a gravitational field. But there's something, you know, you don't see these forces, but you can feel the effects of them acting on you. Um, so I'm curious, like what holds these different paradigms in place? And I'm borrowing from Mickey Kashtan, who's one of my mentors in nonviolent communication. But she talks about a story um, that has three components. And so this story of power over power under is based on this, the belief that like we're separate. So um, that, which is so opposite of that, the voice that speaks for connection and interdependence, but nope, nope, we're all separate. You're on your own here, people. And guess what? There's so little to go around. And she said, those two things are the condition of warfare. If there's one cookie and it's either me or my sister, you know, we're going for it. So, you know, that is the condition of competition and stuff. And she said, if you start to wake up like, well, maybe that's not the full reality here. It, this is often held together by the sense of powerlessness. Like, who am I? I'm just one person. I, I can't do anything like those big, powerful entities. I just can't do anything about them. Whereas this story is, um, she talks about what's the antidote. And so I do think this paradigm is held together by different components. And again, it's that belief of interconnection, interdependence that that um, great underground has always been stewarding that belief. And instead of a mindset of scarcity, it's a mindset of abundance. And instead of feeling ourselves as powerless, it's about reclaiming our power and stepping into courage, You know, having heart and stepping forward. Um, and so for me, looking at power in these two paradigms, I would use the word disempowered to describe our relationship to power, that we are apart from our power. 
And this other paradigm, I am, I'm using the word empower, and the root of that means within our power, exerting our power to choose. And I think sociocracy is so important for this, for this thing of regardless of circumstances, we have a power to our voice, and we have a power to choose how we respond um, within the situations. Okay, I am moving from power, oh, okay, into the next thing, because through this, I'm adding up, if you add up these different components, the emotional tone is really important. When we talked about source, like the internal inner conditions that we're operating from, there's a book, Failure of Nerve, Leadership in the Age of the Quick Fix, and he really amplifies the distinction between anxiety and adventure. But I, I think a lot of times when we're feeling anxious, um, it's this, it's a notion that we, it's an indicator that we might be operating in this paradigm. And of course we are, we were raised and educated in it. Like it's actually going to take work to get our way out of this paradigm. Um, but I think an indicator that we're operating in it is that we often feel a sense of anxiety. Whereas when you add up these components of this alternative story, you're operating from that sense of adventure of like, wait a second, I am, this is what I'm doing in the world. I feel called to do this. And I, and I have all this passion and purpose that is driving me to go do it. Okay, that's power. And you can see we're kind of sliding into purpose. Um, but before we do that, I want to do this this third component next. And this is where I am slotting learning. To me, learning is how we go from one paradigm to another. And again, I just want to amplify, there's nothing wrong with us. We were raised, educated, socialized to be really good and talented in this other paradigm. And it served us, it served, uh, you know, but we're just saying it's no longer suited to the external conditions. And so we need to have a different relationship with learning. I think there's a lot of scarring people have learning was something that was done onto us as kids. But I think this new paradigm, this claiming our power is about claiming our authorship to evolve and develop and evolve ourselves. So Key feature around learning. Um, I love this quote from Dr. Maureen O'Hara of the International Futures Forum, but she says it this way. Psychologically, we were raised in a world that no longer really exists. That thing of trying to reduce things and thinking you're gonna get somewhere, it, it's not gonna get you success anymore. We have a new world we need to navigate and we need a new psychology for that world. We need a whole new way of being. All right, but here's the challenge. How does this develop? when all of our institutions tasked with cultivating consciousness, families, schools, religious institutions, organizations, they are all set back in structures of the 19th and 20th century. And this, this is what a lot of my colleagues and I are trying to design for. Like, where do you go to learn the skills that you need and the structures you need to be successful in complexity? It's not in the places where we used to go for learning. And this is why we're really trying to amplify this notion of transformative social systems that center this ethos of collaboration that we're already finding to be what's successful into this new world. And I just want to say, you know, we're in the information age. Information is coming out, even in this space right now, information is coming at you so fast. Um, and to be able to discern like what's data, what's information, what's knowledge, but really to discern what's wisdom. Um, like there's a different um, gravity to wisdom. You know, these are tried and tested principles that have served individuals and collectors forever. Um, and what we're saying is that these systems offer a pedagogy, you know, it's a curriculum, it's a way of discerning what to do when, as well as people to practice and learn with. And Francois speaks very strongly to this, that um, that social component is so crucial. And for exponential learning, it's, you cannot do this individually. It's really about learning in collectives. So I'm throwing in a bonus. You thought I was going to do seven, here there's an eight. But since sociocracy is the language, I wanted to slot it into the map. And so I'm slotting it as part of the learning. I think sociocracy and any transformative social system is a bridge that brings us into this new paradigm. And it squarely fits in the new paradigm. So it's on the ecotone between, it, it straddles both. And so what I want to point out is that a lot of times, remember how I said we come to the tip, we see the structures, the tools, the methods, and a lot of us are starting to adopt them. And that's great when schools, organizations, all of us, families start to adopt these ways of operating, these structures, you know, that are different than those old world structures. 
Um, it invites us to be different, but there is a period of time where, you know, you can't just lift people up out of power over and put them in power with and expect them to know how to be in a power with ways of being like, there's a period of time where we need to be learning and developing and being patient with humans as we learn and develop how to be in this new structure and develop the skills the inner skills to go in it. So that like ideally, you know, that's alignment and integrity when our inner skills match our outer structures. And I'm telling you, that's there's something magical about this new world. Like there's a capacity for speed and sudden changes that I think is very powerful. We're coming close to landing the plane and then letting you guys talk. Um, purpose and flow. I'm squarely putting this in this alternative paradigm um, and some key features that I'd want to talk to you about. I'm going to start with flow. We touched on purpose a little bit, you know, with the two paradigms and power flow for those of you who aren't familiar with it, but it's some, like, you know, we've been talking a lot about source or inner conditions. And so flow is this internal state. It's a mental state. I'm going to say it's even more embodied, but where someone feels so focused in an activity at hand, it doesn't usually happen during recreation. It usually happens when you're actively engaged with the challenge. So again, challenges aren't bad. Um, it's when, you know, we just want to up our skills to manage them. But when we get locked into and focus on a challenge, we, we immerse ourselves in it and we can really enjoy the process of the activity. And the theorist um, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi is the one who flow and it's called optimal experience um, is credited um, with this by this theorist. Key features to pay attention to here is this graph. And again, here's the word challenge and the word skill that we've talked about earlier. And you can see that when our skills are low and the challenge is high, which is kind of where we are right now, <laughs> um, you know, the challenges are growing higher. Um, of course, we're going to feel anxiety. So just to normalize, like, gosh, of course, we're feeling anxiety. And the way out of anxiety is learning. It is capacity and skill building. Um, because the sweet spot where, I, where I'm encouraging us to think about taking learning to is by when we up the um, development of our skills to work on these increasing challenges, we can get highly engaged. And in the old world, we really needed to motivate people with carrots and sticks. In this new world, this it's called autotelic, that people enjoy the experience so much that they'll repeat it just for the sake of doing it. So it's a very different way of working. I, there's a lot, let me just say this, it's an elusive state, you cannot force it. It's an emergent property. Um, so the most you can do is to cultivate the conditions for in which it can arise. And so here's some of the conditions and I'm highlighting these conditions because I think sociocracy as well as other social systems are very helpful to achieving flow states. So, you know, there's this set of having clear goals and progress, you know, all the aims and just having that group be so clear on what they're doing as individuals and a group. That clear and immediate feedback that is so embedded in sociocracy like those quick cycles of feedback. And again, especially if you're, you know, with the Bernadette stuff, but if you're doing sociocracy in a developmental way and really trying to up your people's skills, then you're really going to be helping them work in flow conditions. And then I just want to point out before we leave flow that there's um, what Cheek Sent Me High did with individual flow, Keith Sawyer study group flow. And I do think this matters a lot. And Francois, John, Karen Gimnigan, and I were in a group that studied this concept of the multi-mind. But this thing of, um, you know, a conductorless orchestra, or, you know, when jazz musicians riff with each other, like they're, they're playing just from this dance with each other. And um, so the conditions are similar. And again, I think sociocracy is very powerful, but that clarity of purpose and aim, that sense of agency and being in control, that equal participation, familiarity, not just with the work, but with each other, you know, the socios, and then um, the importance of communication parts. Okay, we are tracking along. We're just turning this over to you. I'm summarizing. In summary, what we talked about today was the rift, the growing mismatch between the world's complexity and our own. We talked about the shift, the need to start layering learning in everything that we do, becoming very deliberately developmental. Um, and I want to really leave you on a little bit of a high note that like, 
Um, you know, Dave Snowden, who is a complexity scientist, I once heard him said, complexity is different, but it's not necessarily difficult. So, you know, there is a learning curve to all this, but this new world, anyone who talked about this new world, and there's lots of thinkers who've been talking about this, they're all very clear about there's a lot of constructive elements. Um, and so just for me, the little bit of dabbling that I'm doing between old paradigm, new paradigm is... I know that I spent a lot of my life living from script. I was kind of half asleep at the wheel of my life. And like, I'm just like, I'm a good girl. What does a good girl say now? Yes, of course I will do that. Um, and in this new world where change is happening so rapidly, scripts don't matter. We don't have time to read the scripts. You know, this uh, the rapid change is inviting us to become very present. You're on a surfboard. The waves of change will knock you off like it is split if you're not really present and in the moment. And so there's something about, I do think the new condition are inviting humans into a greater state of presence within themselves. Um, I'm going to, there's just one more quote, like, and it's related to this, but um, Acoff, Russell Acoff, who's a systems thinker, is one of the many people who talked about this change of age. So just really getting clear that we're in this transition period and transition periods are hard. Um, but what is what the strain that we're feeling, that overwhelm, that exhaustion that we're feeling is because we have a foot in both worlds. And he's saying that it's not until we step fully into the new world, into the unknown, into the adventure of exploring, like, what is this new world um, that we're really going to um, get out of the strain? And a, an acknowledgement that we can step back, like it is possible to say, I don't know what's out there and that's so scary. So I just want to cling to what I know. And so we can step backwards into the age of like command and control that we're used to, but it will speed up our demise. And so I just really want to invite you in the micro decisions of your life as individuals and as groups to remember, like, are we choosing, are we deciding from that internal state of anxiety or are we going to choose from that sense of adventure? Period. Hang on, I'm stopping my sharing and it's all about you guys. Hang on, how do I stop sharing? Hang on. Stop sharing.